All right. Our last talk of the day is uh, Seth Naiman, a fisheries biologist with NOAA Fisheries, and he's going to talk about a method to implement a natural flow natural flow regimes for regulated rivers. Seth earned a Bachelor's of Science from Oregon State University and a Master's of Science in Fisheries Biology from Humboldt State University. After positions with Idaho Fish and Game, the National Park Service, and the Yurok Tribe, he began working for the National Marine Fisheries Service in 2008. Seth participated in several of the TRRP's work groups, the Trinity River Hatchery Technical Team, and he's an alternate on the TMC. He is a longtime resident of Humboldt County and enjoys fishing, hunting, kayaking, and rafting. And uh, welcome, Seth. That was a uh, old bio from somewhere. I don't know where you dredge that up. Well, thanks, everyone. I know I'm the uh, last talk of the day here, so uh, thanks for sticking sticking with, with me. Um, I'm really excited to be here, really excited to talk about something that I'm passionate about, Nick is passionate about, something we're very excited to share with folks. Uh, I'd like to start with some acknowledgments just uh, briefly. You know, the record of decision at the time in 2000, it was, it was groundbreaking. It was based on the best available science with over, uh, over a decade or more of, of study. It secured water volumes for the river. It really initiated the Trinity River Restoration Program, and in some ways, the record of decision is why we're all here today. So, did a lot of good things. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the the work that the Hoopa Valley Tribe put into that uh, record of decision. And I know for the Hoopa Valley Tribe, the record of decision was it it was like a treaty or it was to them a treaty and i understand the importance of that to them i would also like to acknowledge ken linky kyle de julio and justin alvarez who uh helped kind of package up some of the stuff i'm going to talk about as a nepa alternative for the upcoming consultation that's going on between uh, Bureau of Reclamation and National Marine Fisheries Service. And Nick couldn't be here today. He had to go back to teach a teach a class. Um, so I'm going to give the second half of his talk today also. So I got an outline for today. Got a clicker here too. What's it? The red red dot. Okay. A uh, brief outline, just the background information. I'm going to go over, kind of do a little bit of a deep dive into the alteration of the Trinity River hydrology over time, the ecological uh, effects of that flow alteration, some of them, and the real-time flow management method that we're excited to share with you today, and some results. You know, I'd like to start this talk just by saying there have been, as other people have mentioned, people that have been here since time immemorial that have used the, the resources of the, of the river. Trinity Dam, a lot of this background I'm going to blast through. Trinity Dam was uh, built and began partial regulation in 1961. That's a picture of it right there and the hatchery with Lewiston Dam also. I know you guys have already seen a bunch of this stuff today. And uh, Derek showed uh, a uh, graph of this, but this is basically the average inflow into Trinity Reservoir is 1.2 million acre feet. The Trinity River gets about half of it going this way. The other half goes to Whiskey Town uh, Reservoir. These are the rod flow hydrographs. Right here, there's five water year types. I know a lot of you have already seen a bunch of this in the last few days. There's uh, basically, uh, this is meant to mimic like a snow melt hydrograph. And as you can see, the extremely, extremely wet water years are shifted to the right because the thinking is as you have more, when there's more snow, it melts uh, slower and so you have long with more snow you have a longer uh, duration of snow melt uh, i'm going to talk about some gauges today focus on a few gauges in this area 
One of them is Salmon River at Sums Bar, the other Trinity River above Coffee Creek, and then Trinity River at Lewiston, the one of uh, most interest. But I'm going to focus mainly on Salmon River at Sums Bar, but also Trinity River above Coffee Creek. And importantly, they all share they all share uh, common ridge lines. And basically, when our storms, our storms typically come from the the west, like winter storms come from the west or the north, sometimes from the south, more infrequently, rarely from the east. So generally, when they come from the west like that, they're affecting all these gauges in this area in the same way. And this is just a graph from 1958 showing the response of these three gauges to uh, storms throughout that year. Uh, importantly, Trinity River above Coffee Creek and Salmon River at Sums Bar are not, dam are not dammed. Um, here's the period of record for those. We're very lucky to have Salmon River at Sums Bar and Trinity River at Lewiston, both starting in water year 1912. And all of the streams are uh, rain, uh, rain and snow runoff dominated with a very low base flow index. Uh, streams that have a high base flow index would be like Shasta River, McLeod, Pitt River, where you have a, a big um, spring or groundwater influence. I'm going to use time periods similar to uh, what Eli talked about, four different time periods, although mine are, I think, slightly <laughs> slightly different. Maybe the pre-dam, I think, Eli showed you, um, went to 1961. I use 1960. Um, but anyway, they're, they're, those are the, the four periods I'm going to break some of these analyses into. And I'd just like to state that, you know, there's a ton of papers out there on what happens when you dam a, a river. And, you know, there's a quote there that basically some simplistic and stati static environmental flow rules are going to lead to further degradation of river systems. Obviously, the seminal paper by Dr. Leroy Pop. Pop, the natural flow regime was, uh, you know, I think a big, um, big milestone in river management that a lot of a lot of people have read or or know about. So I'm going to talk about this, what I call the 50 percent date. And it's just the date at which 50% of the flow volume has gone down the river. If you made a flow duration curve, it'd be like the, uh, the 50th percentile date on a flow duration curve. And we're just going to look at it this way. So the Salmon River, this is a Salmon River at Sums Bar. And in 2016, that 50% date was March 5th. You get about half the flow before March 5th, about half the flow after. So Trinity River at Lewiston in 2016, that 50% date was May 20th, about eight weeks uh, later than the Salmon River at Sums Bar. And these are all of those 50% dates going back to 1912. So some things I want to point out. Um, the biggest thing is that after this is when the record of decision was initiated. And after that date, that 50% date was almost always in May, and it was basically always later than the Trinity River at Lewiston. Uh, what it, it was never in the pre-dam record. It was never as late as the dates in um, in the in the rod period. Here's here's the uh, the averages, the average date of those so you can see the rod may 11th whereas in the pre-dam area era for trinity river at lewiston was april 7th so we really shifted this date a lot later by shifting all of that proportion of flow um, to the right also these real low dates here are all uh, extremely wet water years and interestingly even when you have when you have a lot of snowpack and you um, shift your hydrograph, like in the rod, shift it to the right. That's actually only for the snowmelt portion, and it's a little bit counterintuitive. But in uh, an extremely wet water year, here the the distribution of flows across the individual water year, the, that that fifty percent day is actually earlier in extremely wet water years. So then, when you overlay these rod hydrographs, 
um, with the, you know, wetter being shifted further to the right, it actually shifts it further away from how it would be naturally. So here's a, what the uh, negative correlation of two hydrographs looks like. So in 2016, our rod, our Record of decision releases in 2016 were negatively correlated with Salmon River at Sums Bar. Part of that's probably our summer flows, but as you can see, it's a complete mismatch, a complete decoupling of the hydrology. And so here's all of those correlations going back to 1912. And what you see, this is the pre-dam era here. And the correlation between Trinity River at Lewiston, Salmon River at Sums Bar is 0.86, pretty good. It's a couple of years here are kind of low, but overall stable and um, high. And then when the dam was built, those just fell out. And then we got a bunch of years in which there's like these negative correlations. So, you know, Salmon River, Sums Bar, all the hydrology, basically all the rivers in the area are coming down and then we jack flows up. And so in the rod era, the rod really didn't fix that. And the average correlation between these two gauges is 0 0.17 from the pre-dam era of 0 0.86. Um, this is a base flow index. Todd told me he'd buy, buy me a six pack of beer if I put this in here. And so I did. And um and but basically the idea here so all these streams i said have a low base flow index all of them trinity river lewiston and tree above coffee creek Salmon river at sums bar very low base flow index 0 0.69 and as you can see when the dam is built that's this blue line that went way up and now even in the rod era 0 0.36 as a hydrologist you would now we've essentially recategorized the trinity river to be a um groundwater dominated basin or spring a spring fed stream and this is what you're seeing here is a representation of what todd was talking about how we have uh basically really unnaturally high uh, flows in the summer Coefficient of variation, not a huge story here. I'm going to kind of gloss over this, but this is when the dam was built right here. So the coefficient of variation got a lot um, more variable, and it's more variable in the rod era, although the, um, the average is about the same, 1.1 or something like that. But you can see historically the coefficient of variation is within a narrow band of you know around around one or 1 1.2 and then the dam really screwed that up and it's still more variable which is a counterintuitive result that i don't want to get too deep into the weeds on um so some of the ecological effects of dam release asynchrony there's just like this huge list right i mean we could develop you know you saw don's uh what don was talking about what todd said eli said earlier others you know there's just this uh a huge list that could go on forever i'm going to talk about um that box didn't really work right it's supposed to be up there reduced sediment transport i'm going to talk about reduced sediment transport and you know a natural tributary for delta formation for that matter We'll see if this one works. Here's another big list. I'm going to talk about suppressed growth of juvenile salmonids. I'm going to touch on that because Eli really covered it really well. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the lack of flows and triggers for juveniles and fries. So this is a picture of, of uh, Deadwood Creek. Uh, Todd took these pictures back in uh, 2019. And Deadwood Creek is the first tributary that comes into the Trinity River below Lewiston Dam. In 2018, there was a car fire, and the car fire came up from, I think, from the Redding side, I believe, and then it burned down into the headwaters of Deadwood Creek and made these uh, big fire scars in Deadwood Creek. And then we had a big storm in March of 2019, and that was the first year that um, that – there was uh at following the storm and in in that year there was recorded there was a paper by usgs staff over 
the study drainages in Whiskey Town and sediment loads in some of the creeks over there were up to 64 times greater than pre-fire sediment loads. So what happened was during that fire, um, Deadwood Creek blew out like this. Another, if you study rivers, you spend a lot of time on rivers. Another thing that might strike you about this picture that was really weird for me when I went up and looked at it in 2023, the delta of this creek goes upstream. So you know you got a problem when your tributary delta is moving up upstream like that. And it's because the Trinity River at Lewiston was 300 CFS during that whole time period, very low. So it can't transport any of this sediment at all. And what Todd found was that there was, in that time, there was 733 reds um, between there and Rush Creek, where some of that sediment could get mobilized. And we think probably a very high proportion of those, certainly the ones that are near the creek, were co complete mortality for, for Chinook salmon reds. And the same thing happened in 2023. And it essentially, and I believe this year also, essentially it's been happening each year since then. And I took these pictures, that's James right there. And you, this is in 2023, that type of uh, sediment on top of the reds is going to assure almost 0% survival because you have both, both sediment oxygen demand. So the, the matter is decaying and it's using oxygen when it decays on the reds. And then you also have less water velocity over the red, over the eggs. And so the salmon eggs just die. Here's the georeference red locations. This is from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service staff and others who do uh, red surveys up here. Each one of these dots is a red location. That's the Deadwood Creek confluence. So certainly all these reds in here, um, probably 100% mortality for the ones that are the eggs in there for that are closest to, um, to the creek. Moving on to uh, poor temperatures for salmonic growth. You saw this graph earlier. I had another one in here I took out just for sake of time. But basically, you know, what Eli showed you is that th these are the modeled modeled flows for 2000 through 2018 without the dam. So you can just see how much more time each, and these are each years, how much more time each one of these years would have spent inside that dark band which is the juvenile the optimal temperature for juvenile growth and we've been found on other rivers they can grow even uh, just as good or even better up here if they have enough food you know as don mentioned they're poikilotherms they're um, or as as todd mentioned they you they can use these different areas to go and digest their food and, and grow even faster so there was only in in the rod era there was only nine percent of days for all of these uh years where our temperatures were in the optimal juvenile growth range and then you saw if you were here yesterday you saw bill pinnock's talk the fish are smaller now so after the rod era we yeah we made more fish but they're smaller and so if their survival out to sea is non-linear then it, it we might just be creating a lot of smolts that don't survive that well I want to touch on the portfolio effect just a, a little bit here. I had uh, some more slides, but I had to take stuff out in terms of time. This is from an example from um, Sturrock et al., who did a paper on the Stanislaus River. And basically what I wanted to show here was that here's the pre-dam flows, and here's the uh, post-dam flows here. And then what they did was they looked at the the difference in flows. So basically during that period when they're storing water in the reservoir and not releasing any water, the difference in flows between those two period is down in these months. It's uh, up during the where you have this par period, but then down again during the smolt year, the smolt time period as they bring the flows down. Shaded areas are um, the peak fry migration period. And basically what they found was that the, the flow regime on the Stanislaus is really only serving the par life stage. And it's 
and there's basically no f- flow or very low flows for the fry and and also the smolts and you can read some of those those quotes over there but you know basically the the flow regime is decoupled from the unimpaired hydrograph and if they would have if some of these fry would have survived they'd have a lot uh, better recruitment and this just shows that Basically, as flow variability increased, the recruits produced per spawner also increased, and le- less variable flows were associated with reduced fish production. So this is these are all of the pre-dam Trinity River at Lewiston pre-dam flows. And 1912 to 1960, and this is the portfolio, if you will, the hydrologic portfolio that salmon evolved to. Highly variable, and when you give them that big portfolio, they have a big suite of life histories to adapt to that. Except we, you know, we basically took all of that and and eliminated all of the winter flows and then pushed everything over here to the right. So we compressed the habitat going down this way. We compressed it going that way. And if you remember the temperature graph that Eli showed where we had this historically had this big range of temperatures like this, And then now with the dam flows, it's much more muted out. We squash the temperature uh, portfolio of the river as well. So when you do that, you essentially reduce the phenotypic and genetic diversity of of all of the animals in the river. Um, Here's a, this is a graph from a paper, Naaman at all 2008, no relation. This is Robert J. Naaman, which a lot of you probably know really well-known researcher is spelled different too but what's interesting about this I, you know, I found this paper I was reading through it they have an example from South Africa and an example from the Trinity River California and here's the uh let's see I'll just read this real comparative ability of natural environmental flows to create and maintain U.S. Pacific salmon habitat and Q spawning shown as a hypothetical hydrograph that largely mimics temporal discharge patterns of the Trinity River, California and the life history requirements of Chinook salmon. So this was a theoretical, uh, a theoretical hydrograph that they suggested could be released to support all the fish. What I want to point out is that this theoretical hydrograph is uh, completely synchronized with the actual hydrograph here. When they drew the theoretical hydrograph, they didn't dr- draw like a big peak here when flows were low or have their theoretical hydrograph shifted way out here to the right. Their theoretical hydrograph of what would be best for the Trinity River back in 2008 was a synchronized uh, flow regime. And so Nick and I really wanted to try and operationalize this and think about ways, you know, how how can we do this? How can we get this done? So that's the question is, can we, can we implement a real-time flow regime mimicking nature? And the whole idea is to basically piggyback on discharge signals from proximal gauges carefully. And if you think about it, Lewiston discharge is just a, is, 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 it's really just a multiple of any one of these gauges. So if you were trying to meet this red line with this black line, you'd multiply it by say 0.5. If you were trying to meet this red line using this black line, you'd multiply it by two, right? It's kind of, in essence, it's that simple but it's a little more complicated. Um, there are, so the the model that we developed, it uses, we have all these constraints, right? That we can't get around. And one of them is our, our, flow, our flow minimums. Okay, so.
the least underspending and the and it minimizes basically uh, uh, ha habitat availability during rearing and out migration. So how does it work exactly? Well, it's almost as simple as I mentioned before, where it's you have a a um, parameter that gets optimized times the B120 uh, water volumes for that month times the Salmon River at Sums Bar flow for that day, and that gives you the Lewiston flow for that day, except we can do this for, say, like three days in advance also. It does. It works fine with the California Nevada River Forecast Center forecasting tools, and then we can also disaggregate these um, into hourly once you have the the daily flows. So would we get some complaints? Probably, but you know, oh, a big one I wanted to talk about was what Eli mentioned, how you know we're going to have more rainfall, less snowpack, and that's going to increase flooding. Well, if we if we every drop of water that gets released in the winter reduces the probability of spill, um, we're basically helping with flood control and and spill risk, and it actually has benefits to reservoir levels later in the spring. So um, let's see, the model did pretty well, pretty much all most of the time, and these are actually calculated for Trinity River above Coffee Creek because we used uh, that as well in another in another run. Um, you could use any creek. You could even just use precipitation itself, and uh, the multipliers will get optimized. But 94% uh, of the years we used, we were within 10% of those water year volumes. And sometimes in dry years, the model wouldn't spend um, all of the water, but we can work on that. Some years we have this crash to minimums, but you know what i would say about oh i did also want to point out like here's a 2015 2015 our model put the river up to almost 8000 cfs in a dry year and one of the problems with using like quartiles medians averages all these things is that this is the type of variability you miss so in a rod hydrograph you'd only go to 4500 so just imagine the geomorphic work that we could do by mimicking what's going on in nature. Um, but anyway, these crash to minimums that's going on in the model here, like in this year, 2012, here's a normal water year. Oh, sorry, the blue line is Salmon River at Sums Bar. The black line is the uh, RTM result. And so, you know, right in here, April is when the water year is designated. Like we in this year, we already know what the water year is going to be. So we can stand back in this, like the, these last tails, we can sit back, the flow work group can shape these how, however they want. So just some results. For 2016, the RTM results shifted the 50% date uh, eight weeks earlier to March 10th. I think the Salmon River at Sums Bar was March 5th. Um, in this case, the correlation went from negative 0.13 to 79%. And then these are all of those correlations again, same graph you saw before, except over here, the RTM results for correlation between uh, the RTM results and Salmon River at Sums Bar, not totally, um, uh, you know, I guess not a totally novel idea considering we use that gauge to uh, develop the the flows, but still it's, it's a big improvement in mimicking the local hydrology over the, the past era going from 0 0.17, 0 0.17 here to uh, 0.68 for correlation all those years net never a negative correlation either and in some of these years up to 80 percent correlation with uh, local hydrology for the 50 percent annual volume date that was shifted uh, down from may 11th almost a month on average to april 12th so this was this here is the record of decision after the last flows and we shifted that down overall 
met those uh, wet years a lot, a lot better. And then suspended sediment transport, want to talk about this a little bit. And so basically the sediment transport is, uh, you know, though these are log scales here, so it's quite a bit, uh, quite a bit greater for suspended sediment, again, for fine sediment and core sediment as well. I know I'm about done here. Um, for the 2019 example, for when the car fire came over the hill in 2018 and then the river blew out here, or the Deadwood Creek blew out, um, using the real-time management tool, uh, be right in here around March, um, March 25th or something in here, flows were 1,315 CFS. And they came up to, um, they came up again to like 3,500 a week later. That would have been more than enough to um, get this get this sediment out of there, and you know, probably millions of salmonid eggs would have survived better. That's it. These are all the, those are all the 2004 to 2023. That's what all the RTM years uh, look like. Nice and messy, like we like it. <laughs>